Hello, everyone, and welcome to End of Life University podcast, where we share real talk about life and death. I'm your host, Dr. Karen Wyatt, and thanks for joining me here for episode number 305. In just a moment, I'll be sharing with you a lovely conversation I had with Becky Odd Jennison, who is the host of the Death Dialogues podcast. And Becky and I literally could have just talked all afternoon, but I took a a portion of our potential conversation and shared it here with you. And I hope you will enjoy that as much as the two of us enjoyed having the conversation. Before we get to that, I just want to remind you that I have a brand new second podcast called What Really Matters Everyday Spirituality. In that podcast, I'm I'm sharing just solo episodes for now and really talking about the nitty gritty of the spiritual journey of life and how we grow, how we survive and navigate the difficulties that come our way and the lessons that we learn in the process of doing all of that. Because just learning the theory of spiritual lessons is really not enough. We actually have to put them into practice in our own lives. And so that's what this What Really Matters podcast is all about, figuring out in the midst of the journey, how do we do our best and how do we become our very best selves while we're living through one challenge after another in this day-to-day life. So I hope you'll join me for that podcast, What Really Matters. Right now, it's available on Spotify, Stitcher, and several other platforms. It will be available on Apple Podcasts, supposedly very soon, but I'm not sure how long that will take. So just check it out. I'll leave a link in the show notes and you can go to a page where you can listen to some of the episodes and see what you think. So now without further ado, we'll move on to my interview with Becky Odd Jennison. As always, I'll be back at the end of the interview for it with a few takeaways and to say goodbye. So here we go. I'm so excited for my interview today with my guest, Becky Odd Jennison, who is the host of the Death Dialogues Project. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Becky, though I'm sure most of you are, or at least should be, with her podcast and her work, I'm going to read a bio so you can get to know her a little bit better. After a lengthy career in human services, Becky considers herself a therapist gone rogue. I love that term. (laughs) Believing that sitting with each other's experiences is our greatest teacher. She cherishes being trusted to hold people's tender stories. The Death Dialogues Project and podcast was created to help bring conversations surrounding death, dying, and the aftermath out of the closet, increasing literacy surrounding death. Becky's intimate experiences with her loved one's deaths and home vigils and her professional experience around death sparked a passion to facilitate broader conversations. Uh, Becky will also be publishing two books early in 2022, which is, I'm so impressed, not one book, but two books at the same time. And they are titled, And Then the Stars Spoke, A Memoir Through the Lens of Death, and Death and Its Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Beautiful Lessons, Field Notes from the Death Dialogues Project stellar titles on both of those. Fantastic, Becky. Becky has <laughs> dual citizenship in the United States and New Zealand and primarily lives in New Zealand for the past 10 years. You can learn more and follow the project at the website deathdialogues.net. And I will leave links to her social media connections for Instagram and Facebook. And then also Becky's email address if anyone would like to get in touch with her. So Becky, thank you so much for joining me here today. Oh, I'm so thrilled to be here, Karen. Thank you for asking. Well, we had a wonderful conversation together not that long ago for your podcast. And so now it's finally my turn. I get to ask you questions and I'm just excited to see where where our discussion takes us today. Oh, I am too. Thank you. 
So I was hoping I want to hear more about your story because uh, I'm really curious about what led up to the moment that you decided to start interviewing people and creating the Death Dialogues Project. If you would talk to us a little bit more about the experiences you had with death and grief in your own life. Absolutely. I'll... um... You know, that's part of the foundation of my memoir, the question people ask, like, how how can you do this project? How can you be involved with death all the time? And, you know, why would you? And I realized it goes back from my childhood even and exposure to death. But I won't speak on that as much as when I'm in my more formative years of um, going into... First of all, I went into nursing so I could pay my way through to go into school to become a therapist and work in clinical mental health. But um, just understanding that death was a part of my life before getting into um, that kind of work. And so the first work I did was in nursing homes. And um, we had a lot of people there who were alone and seeming to have these prolonged periods in that you know, mid-state, um, clinching against death. And of course, uh, nobody was talking about it. And then the times would come with people actively dying. And I'm just compelled to sit at the bedside of people. And you even have people in these states and times of their lives reaching out, honey, can you can just come sit with me? And, you you know, the medical situation and your load of people that you're taking care of for the day. And more than that, the hierarchy's message is, you know, no, we don't sit. We don't have time for sitting. But I would. I would sneak that in when I could. And it never resonated with me that that was the way to practice or, you know, be professionals around death. And then um, came actual nursing that I did in the hospitals while I was working, um, I actually only did uh, general nursing for in the hospital. I did about a year of nursing homework, and then I did about a year in a, or a little bit more in a hospital where I floated floor to floor. And a lot of times I was in intensive care or post-ICU because I floated where they need the most help. But there were also general floors. And I remember in ICU the first exposure to um, how death care, post death care happened there and, um, how without going into all the detail, how much it lacked any sacred attention. I remember asking the person, I was at LPN, I asked the RN, you know, do you, do you just, do you need to go take care of other things and just let me handle it? Because I was so traumatized by the way the body was being handled. And so if we look at like crucible moments in your life, you know, that's boom, like, okay, this is not good. You know, this, I feel like I can make a judgment on this, you know, this needs to not happen this way. And throughout that process, just really being a keen observer of how death was skirted around and that failure mentality we have with death. And then Going on, from then on, my work was in mental health, and I worked in a community mental health center, and case case managing um, a caseload of 85 people who had been de- de- deinstitutionalized, and, and then on to continuing to go to school all, throughout all of this, and then led into more, um, finally, my master's degree, sitting for my licensure, and having private practice, but through that, all interfacing with death and um, people ending their lives and people contemplating ending their lives and um, also ended with uh, in my career in the States, I had a private practice. So I sat with people in a very acute grief states. I was in the homes of people after someone had ended their lives when I worked a, a couple of years in my children's school district during a transitional period with my private practice. And, um, and then the last uh, several years, my husband is British and a cardiologist and what we Americans would consider practice a bit holistically. And he had developed, he was specialized in congestive heart failure after he started with heart transplant, but with the, the 
um, wonderful medicine that can manage treatments that kind of put himself out of that realm of business because heart transplants became so few and far between. And he could be somebody that would get second opinions and many times be t- have people taken off of a heart transplant list. But in the reality of that, his specialty was congestive heart failure, which that name is such a depressing name. I always kind of lobby, can we change that name? Because yeah, definitely. People, people can live long lives with, with congestive heart failure, um, popular, or, or contrary to that, that title. Um, but we also did have people at end of life. And you know, one of the things I was really impressed with his work was his ability as a physician to not see death as a failure and to actually um, sit with patients and have conversations about end of life. And so we did a lot of um, workshops with physicians and we were teaching hospital and had medical students coming through. So we really became, um, that became part of our conversation is me with the psychological background and him with um, the medical background of trying to encourage doctors and health professionals to um, explore their relationship with death. Because my firm belief was many people were probably death averse themselves. And until you come to terms with your own mortality, you are not gonna be able to have those deep conversations with the people that you're working with. And, and then also trying to be, as we would get students come through, you know, try to be that point in place where they would be able to say that somewhere <laughs> that was addressed, you know, and I think it's being addressed a little bit better now, mm-hmm. but um, through that process, we, I, we were reading a New York times article and came across um, Harvey Chachanov's work with dignity therapy. Uh, he's a Canadian academic and psychiatrist who created and studied this form of therapy and with cancer patients primarily and the criteria being there's six months left to live and which of course you know that's like telling people when they're going to have their babies but um a ballpark anyway Mm -hmm. and so we contacted him and, and had a chat with the three of us about what about with us trying this with congestive heart failure, people that are at end of life. And he um, was very excited about that. And so I started doing that. And that was some of the most meaningful work of my life. And without going into long detail, they end up with a narrative document uh, that you create out of a set um, of 10 specific questions that they've answered and and then your last session is sitting across from them and reading it back to them, primarily under the guise of, please tell me if I've gotten something wrong or if I've corrected it or if I need to correct anything. But it was some of the most powerful work that I've ever done. It was an opportunity for them to leave something behind that highlighted the less of a biography and more of an emotional and sometimes very factual uh, conversation about the times that when I felt most alive and what's been most special to me and what I want my loved ones to remember about me. And um, with, within their studies, they found that it really increased people's well-being at end of life to, and we were seeing this having um, people that would be up in hospice in our hospice unit that we'd go visit up there, not in the hospital. And, you know, we remember this one who had written a biography and was this, you know, fighter pilot and written these eloquent words. And, you know, we forget about that when we're just seeing these people Mm -hmm. for 15, 30 minutes, if they're lucky, usually 10 minute sessions. And so it's a beautiful way for them to, be in touch, um, back in touch with their living. And, um, and then it's a document that they can, we would give them to doc bound documents and they would decide who they wanted to, to share that with. And then part of that, that could be, you kind of need to be a writer to do the therapy or 
a love of the writing because you're not just, you know, writing. I would get the transcript and then I would create a document from that, a narrative from that. And it was also an opportunity to delicately circle around some difficult conversations that the person wasn't really able to have with their family about maybe some wishes that they had um, post-death concerns that they had. And yeah, so I could go on about that, but that was super powerful. Yeah, that sounds like wonderful work. I just, I wanted to say, I love the power of reading a person's story back to them because Mm. I think that That's something a lot of us don't very often get to hear our own stories in someone else's voice, even reading that to us. Anyway, that that struck me. It is. It was so powerful. I mean, this just really, I don't know, you know, sometimes when you're in the helping field, it's not always work that you you know that you've had an impact, right? You hope Mm -hmm. you have. And you know that a lot of the work that you're doing with people is something that will um be in their lives for a period of time, you know, it'll it'll need to develop to actually come to fruition. So to see this in real time, just the people, you know, across the board, I'm the very first person I did her, her first words out of her mouth. So she grabbed my cheek on cheeks on both sides and, and looked me right in the eyes and said, you're an angel. (laughs) <laughs> it was like, oh, oh my that's gosh. so sweet. It was so precious. And um, and then and it all felt like that. I mean, we had um, yeah, just young people who had had our heart, heart trans uh this I think of this young man who had a heart transplant, he had two young babies, and you know, his his wife and his mother came in and made a specific trip. They lived out in the country, farming community made a specific trip to come in and person and let me know how powerful that document had been for them. And, you know, some people would want to um, save it. Some people, you know, it would be something that people would have after they died. Other people shared it openly. I had one woman who, you know, because of that unpredictability, didn't didn't dwindle down quite like we thought the trajectory, my husband thought the trajectory might be, and reported back to me that she had a birthday party and had gotten up on the table and read it out to people. And the birthday party was kind of a celebration of, you know, as you would when you've gotten a a prognosis, you know, with your last birthdays or as you could do, you know, celebrate those people around you and, um, you know, make the most of that interaction. And that was one of the ways she did. So, yeah, that was really powerful work. And so I came over to New Zealand and, we actually shared that with our um, hospital staff here and hospice, and um, they had a biography program here with um, where you have volunteers that go out and do bi- more biographies, less less of a therapeutic interaction. Uh, biographies with people, it's very sweet. And um, I volunteered supervising them for a period of time just because – just to have a place, you know, to come back to as a group in case um, they needed some support and feedback in that process. And um, so you've been yeah. listening to people's stories for a long time then in different contexts. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so then I stopped doing that work because I didn't know I was going to stop. I, you know, put it on hold because my brother was, um, called me on the phone one day. We, my brother and I are very, very close. And um, he had been out here and we'd had this beautiful trip. I'm so thankful we had that of he and I just going on a road trip all around the Northland of New Zealand and, go, you know, revisiting some of our difficult childhood and talking about the future. But he'd had a couple issues with memory flares and um, two different times that he'd required an MRI. So that's about in May of 2015. I get my mom out here living with us in the end of 2015. And she's in her 90s. And then just after New Year's in January of 27 or 2016, my brother calls me, which he would do because of my husband being a doc and then me being having the clinical mental health background, you know, to process some things. And he said, hey, Beck, I just, I need to talk to you. We need to process this. He's like, I don't know what's going on. I cannot remember my computer password for the life of me. 
and they had recently moved and he had a pretty, uh, yeah, a, a big, a big job that he did, big work, um, that he did. And, you know, he had to uproot that and move to a, a different place, a geographic place doing that. And, and so we processed and I was, you know, I was kind of doing a mini mental exam in there while we're talking without going through, you know, <laughs> sequential sevens and who's the president didn't go that far, you know, but just really trying to, yeah. So what, you know, how has it been this past week? And just those kind of questions and everything really felt like it was intact. And then at the end of the conversation, I said, so how long did it take you to remember your password? And he's like, ah, and he cracks up laughing. He's like, I haven't remembered. No, I don't have it. I don't, I can't get it back. I don't have that. So it's like, okay, well, when we started the conversation, we talked for about an hour. We started the conversation. Everything was confidential. Please don't talk to mom about this. Please don't tell anybody about this, which many of our conversations could be like that, especially if it was around physical stuff. And then my mom was waking up and we, he was very upbeat at the end. I really didn't have great concern. And, um, and so I said, hey, we've got to go run a couple errands, but mom's waking up. Do you want to get on the phone with her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I leave them on the phone and, you know, said, hey, you two just hang up when you're done. And I get back about an hour later and my mom's standing at the door just, just as looking like a ghost. She'd seen a ghost. And she said, what's wrong with Max? And I said, no, I don't what? What are you talking about? And she's like, could he have been drinking? Which wasn't an issue for Matt, for, for him, you know? And um, I'm like, mom, what? And she had, within the conversation, they had circled back around to my cousin who had died, who my brother had given the eulogy for, and he did not remember that and hmm. burst into tears. And therein, from that moment on, began this investigation and it took six months of them treating her the him for autoimmune encephalitis because um, there were wisps on his MRIs and shades but not enough to brain biopsy and finally in um, June of that year there that it had increased and they brain biopsied and diagnosed him with primary CNS lymphoma and mm -hmm. It ended up, he almost died in that process because it ended up the medicine that had just barely been keeping his head out of the water, above the water, was um, smaller doses of what would end up being his chemotherapy. So when they took him off of it for 15 days before they, you know, they tapered him before they could get the brain biopsy, he, ju he just about died. I got over there like the day that they had done it or the day after they had done it. And he was every hour he was um, becoming more and more, you know, went from being able to walk a little bit when I got there to being bedridden before the chemo actually started within a couple days. And then wow. it took a period of time. His oncologist would say, I think he's going to wake up. So I stayed with him. I actually stayed by his bedside for two months. Um, and uh, talk about the beautiful, horrible um, yeah. such beautiful love and connection and just heart wrenching, just, just pulled my heart out of my body. And then, um, went back, left thinking, cause he did end up, you know, he's transferred to the rehab hospital right there. Again, I stayed eventually towards the end of that, got a little apartment in their family place down the road, went home with them and, um, took him, we would take him to the outpatient rehab visits. And so I left and that was the most happy of that whole year thinking that he was, you know, oh, he's got this, you know, he's continuing. But what happened was he plateaued and then they tried a different chemo and that didn't do it. And in January of 2017, he died. Um, and that, that's been, you know, my father died when I was 22 of a brain aneurysm that had leaked three years prior and that was a very complex and difficult relationship. And that was a very different grief process. It was a complex grief process. With this one, it was the first time my heart had been shredded. <laughs> and mm -hmm. because, um, yeah, we were extremely close. And then my mother proceeds to have a open 
dialogue for the next nine months and one day announces, this is it, I'm going to die now. And 24 hours later, she was dead. And with both of them, what we'd done in the States because of what I'd learned in New Zealand about doing death differently and had watched this um, amazing documentary called Zen and the Art of Dying, um, a woman that I've now sat with and had a course with her. She's in, from Australia, a death walker. And it really empowered me to bring up to my sister-in-law because what happened was my brother took a very, very, very quick turn. Mm -hmm. And we knew then that um, the death was imminent. So I said, you know, if something come happens before I get there, just consider that you don't have to, it's not an emergency. And some of that time can be the most beautiful time. And so that little bit of a seed was planted and what ended up happening we found this beautifully benevolent um, funeral director that I talked to who explained, when I explained what we wanted to do about keeping him home, he said, I know this is a trend that's going to happen. I've never done it. I've never not embalmed somebody, but I am here for you. And went on to explain where to put the ice and <laughs> said, just stressed over and over, if you call me, we will be there within an hour or two. So anytime, day of night, you don't want to do this. And, and afterwards came up to me um, at his funeral and said how beautifully he'd been cared for and that they so appreciated this being part of this process. And something that I hope more funeral, traditional funeral homes will see as a meeting of, you know, that, that doing things naturally within the home doesn't have to negate their relationship with people because he handled it so absolutely beautifully. Mm -hmm. And so my mom knew of that and asked for that to be done for her as well. And we did that here. She was home four days. He was home, I think three until the night before his funeral. And um, I write about that a lot in my memoir. And then the star spoke um, because they were extremely, powerfully moving and life-changing experiences. So I can just imagine. how it happened was I was doing, um, staging the death dialogue or sta staging the vagina monologues for V-Day, starting to think about it, starting to think about it. And I literally, my brother was like, he's the one who taught me, um, gave me a moral compass, gave me an activism mentality at all, you know, to stand up for what was right taught me how to do that in circumstance in certain circumstances in the isms world and um he whispered I felt in my ear we need to do this about death and I have a little bit of a background in theater a little bit a love of it you know and I've done a little bit in, in writing as well and it just came to me because Eve Insler had written uh the vagina monologues from interviewing 200 women about their vaginas and had <laughs> then turned those that into a verbatim play. I had also been in a verbatim play, The Laramie Project, which was about the death of Matthew Shepard, a young gay man who was brutally murdered and left pinned to a barbed wire fence. And that had been extremely powerful. So that's where the project was born from. Thank you for asking that, which a long version. <laughs> 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 oh, I love hearing these stories, though, because it makes it so clear how all of the threads for this project were part of your life from the beginning. I mean, all, all along, like all of these pieces were gradually coming together and you were being prepared and learning what you needed to know to make this project happen one day. At least that's how that's how it comes across to me as I hear your story. So it's. Uh, it's kind of awe-inspiring to me when I just see how things, the way things work out and how we end up doing doing what we're doing. Thank you so much for noticing that because that's really how it does feel. Death called me all throughout my life, like really called me. But it's not until now that I feel that this is where I was supposed to land with death, you know. Yeah. And what an amazing feeling when, when you, when the, the one day when you open your eyes and you set, suddenly it all makes sense. When you mm. see those pieces falling in place, like, oh, now I kind of understand maybe that played a role in getting me here and teaching me something I needed. And 
And of course, you're really just at the beginning now of the work that you're doing in so many ways, writing these books and uh, putting out your podcast. Like, so there's still so much more to come. And it's all about conversation, isn't it? I mean, that's what I love about it. I don't feel undue pressure um, aside from the intensity of writing the books, of course, especially the memoir. But I don't, you know, I really feel it's been so beautiful to be at this stage of my life and not have um, financial pressure pushing me, you know, push, push, you know, oh, do this or you need to start this or, you know, having that in my mind at all. I've really been blessed to, you know, because there could be a little frustration like death. Why didn't you bring this up to me when I was younger? Right. But now death has given me the space to do this and to do it in a way that lets it organically flow. And um, so I'm just all about letting it unfold the way it wants to. And um, I don't, you know, I don't worry about marketing. I just feel people who will hopefully find this. I mean, I could worry about that a little bit because it is mission oriented that I want people to get it because I know how death averse our society is. Right. And Mm -hmm. um, because it's a grassroots mission, I, you know, I don't have hundreds and thousands of dollars to put into marketing and that type of thing. So I've just um, set myself, soothed myself with that by saying, yeah, let this just be organic and let it reach the people it needs to reach when it needs to reach them and see how this flows. So yeah, we'll see. I have just recently talked to somebody who was very impacted by the, the project after the death of her mother. And she's could be my daughter. She's in her um, 30s, her early 30s. And uh, I haven't announced it or anything because we're in a trial basis, but I might she really wants to be a part of this and she wants to help me. And I have to tell you, it feels really beautiful <laughs> to think of not carrying the project just on my shoulders. And I love the possibility of the intergenerational aspect, you know, of some mm-hmm. input as well. So she's a person that for her work um, conducts interviews surrounding trauma. So she's even comfortable with the conversations themselves. So we'll watch the space again, just let this baby unfold. Yeah, exactly. Because there's always something new going on. And and I was going to say too, not only have you been being prepared for the work all of this time, but so has our society. So has the mm. world in a way, because imagine if you had been inspired 20 years ago to do the Death Dialogues project, it might have been much harder to find people willing to have the conversations and even to find an audience then, because in, at least in my experience, things have really exploded over the last few years. And it seems to me like the death dialogues project really taking off in 2018, that was perfect timing so that it, it was there during our COVID year last year, Mm. you know, there and well-established. And so that that's been part of, part of it all too, is just waiting for the rest of the world to be in the right space for introducing this material Absolutely. And I, I would be amiss if I didn't give a shout out to New Zealand, because I'm up in the Northland of New Zealand, <clears throat> which has been said, that is the highest percentage of creatives up here. And on top of that, New Zealand is extremely creative. And, you know, the way they do theater, the way they do their art. And I have a little, little bit of thought that that has to do with people that aren't bound to be working for their um, health insurance, that that frees some creativity up to take a few months off here or, and, you know, really immerse themselves in a project and not going to have to be worried to get a million dollar bill somewhere down the line if something catastrophic happens. Right. They, and Mm -hmm. it's until I have the conversation with New Zealanders, they're like, wow, you know, we never even thought of that. Hmm. Because it's so far from the the reality of having to pay, you know, the exorbitant costs that we have to pay in America. So, yeah, I won't riff on that too long. But being here and seeing communities who are 
open to different conversations and creatively. So I staged a Death um, Dialogues debut when I was, it first started with me just collecting the interviews in person here. And one of the, in fact, um, the, one of the books, the Field Notes books, book um, starts with the story of this woman's little boy dying of brain cancer when he was six years old. And so I had this two and a half hour interview that I had to condense into, you know, hopefully I was thinking 10 minutes, because if this is going to be in a 90 minute play, right, you can't, you know, and you want a bunch of stories, and somehow you're going to intertwine them. Well, I couldn't get it under 20 minutes. And But people came out for that and they were so affected. And it was just, just like they, like we've sold out every vagina monologue show. They hadn't brought that up here in the North, in Fungare where I live. And people want these difficult conversations and they, you know, again, it's not like they're so much more open to death. It's like it is anywhere. Once you open that door and start asking people about their stories and create a space where it's okay to speak in that way, people really open up. And we did a production with storytellers. I had, I think, five or six storytellers. And we put that on a bigger stage and packed the place. And people stayed and stayed and subgrouped in the audience and talked. And people want these conversations. So if I hadn't been in New Zealand and walked towards that because and been so embraced by the community, which is very multicultural, you know, they're in, in New Zealand, but still it's it's a common thread in New Zealand to accept um, diverse work and different conversations. And I think that really empowered me to move forward. And um, I had an intern who was a friend, a German person who came over here and she's young and she just said, you know, we don't read blogs anymore. We listen to podcasts. And I said, yes, people keep telling me that it's too hard. I can't do, you know, I looked at it. It's complicated. She got on her phone and in five minutes had pulled up the anchor app and gosh, for the first two years or year and a half, I recorded the entire podcast off my iPhone. (laughs) Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? So the technology also needed to be in place, really, to to For make this like work me. possible. Yes. Yeah, yes. <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too. Actually, um, I was. I am curious about talking about New Zealand. Do you, and I don't know how familiar you are with the healthcare system there, but do you find there are different? attitudes among medical professionals are they more open to talking about death and dying more open to advanced care planning with their patients I'm not sure it's more really um, I do know there are people within the realms that advocate you know as as we would see in the United States as well um, but no overall I, I think it's a, the death adverse culture, is pretty widespread. Yeah. Um, and you're, you know, they consider it European here, uh, as far as, you know, it was colonized and it's a lot of, uh, of the medical models come from England. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think it's the same there. I think we're just too busy, you know, saving those lives at all costs. Yeah. But then yeah. you do have beautiful hospices, of course, and palliative care workers and doctors, just like you do anywhere. But, um, but I do think they're really, um, the general population anyway. And, and, you know, some doctors are becoming more and more open. Uh, yeah. yeah. Something that stood out to me from uh, earlier in your story was the the picture of you being a young ICU nurse and kind of suffering moral injury really in the ICU over, over the way people were dying, you know, in a dehumanized fashion. And I've had a couple of other ICU nurses talk about that as well. And then that brought back this memory to me of being a young resident in medicine on call in the hospital and having to do CPR for a code for a patient who we, who the same man coded five times throughout the course of one night. And I just remember being 
sick inside at what we were doing to this man who it was clearly his time to die. And yet we were obligated to do a code until someone in his family was willing to say, you know, you, we, his family at that point had asked us to do everything possible to try to resuscitate him. Anyway, I, I was just thinking of all of the many nurses and medical students and residents and then ICU staff who are suffering with that same kind of moral injury over the way we handle death. And it seems to me we have a huge group of medical people who might need some kind of intervention to help them as well with with their grief. Absolutely. I do. I think it's huge. And it's interesting that you circle back to that because it reminds me, my best friend was one of the ICU nurses there, or we became best friends from, again, I floated, but of course I floated a lot into post ICU and ICU, which were right next door to each other. So we've been, we woven in and out of those, you know, as they needed help, I was a a helper. And um, she said that with the differences of us, you know, I said, I just want to have time to talk with people, to be able to talk to people. And she said, give them to me, And back then, it's horrible to say, give them to me, gorked out, intubated, you know, with all of this science plugged into them. And that's what she loved about it. So that's the other consideration, right, is that there are people that get into certain areas of nursing because they don't want to talk to people. They Mm -hmm. don't want to deal with the, the humanity of another person. They want to deal with the body, and keeping the body alive. And it was actually a gift that she was so transparent about that. And it, because I didn't demonize her for it, I just really, re- cause that's not my strength. You know, that is not the where, where I would go with that. And the other thing that was really sad while we're on that, and I witnessed this and um, when I would do wrote, when I did rotations in the emergency room, I just happened to be there at a time. And also in the internal in the intensive care unit, I think there really needs some, to be some compassion grown for people who attempt to end their lives and survive and go in those spaces because across the board, there they were, I witnessed people being met with animosity, um, almost as if you're taking up, you didn't want to be here, you're taking up a bed that could be for somebody else kind of mentality. Mm. So I think, I I think I would really hope that within the medical field, whatever area it is, that compassion could be addressed a bit more and bedside manner could be addressed a bit more because we know now the mind body, you know, the research is, is flowing out all of the time about, you know, the, the, the results that you get with people when they, they're feeling less stressed and met with care and, even the energetic. I did a did a lot of work with heart math. I did a study with 150 people in that cardiology clinic. And, you know, we know that those kind of energetic waves, when somebody's heart rate variability is balanced and you're in a place of compassion, that that balances the person that's next to me, right? I mean, there mm-hmm. is energetic exchange and you know, that's not woo-woo anymore. <laughs> that's that's science. Exactly. <laughs> and we don't, yeah, I just don't feel like maybe there's enough focus on these things in training. Like, no, it's not just a, if that's your personality, it's a, you know, if pretend you're an actor on a stage, if you have to person, show some compassion. <laughs> well, and also when we look at the rates of burnout in uh, medicine, I, I think it makes sense to me. It's because when we we don't know how to address our own feelings, our own grief, or how to activate our own compassion, no wonder people get burned out trying to provide care to patients and families who are in crisis situations all the time. It, you know, the, it would benefit all of the healthcare providers if they were a little more literate, as you said, around compassion and being able to talk about difficult things like death and dying and grief. Mm, Absolutely. I agree. 
Well, I know, I mean, you, you have such amazing conversations. Your death dialogues are incredible with the people that you talk to. And I know it's all about listening to their stories. And now you're, you're writing this book about the lessons. And I don't want to steal the thunder from that book, but lessons that you've learned from death dialogues. But I'm just curious, is there one lesson you would share to us that stands out for you that may, has made a difference for you in your life that, that you you've learned from having these amazing conversations? Oh, there's so many, there's so many, but I, I think, um, it's, it's a very much of a umbrella lesson. And that's, if, if I could encourage people to do anything is, um, to let themselves open so right now I would be speaking to say somebody's listening to this that is in the throes of feeling very acute you know horrible loss and we want to just like you know just like we have to be trained in childbirth right and I think is important and death um, we need to unclench you know sometimes we just need to unclench to to get the ease to actually come and I think we clench against death in our societies. And um, if we can stop that knee-jerk response that is averse to even going there or clamping down the grief or clamping down as if you can make it go away, I think that's my biggest lesson is open. You know, if try to open and understand death and grief will have its way with you one way or the other, because I think a lot of what we see in society and um, like what I know from my clinical practices and training is if we peel back the layers of anxiety, clinical anxiety, and if we start looking at the cognitions and what the underlying belief system is that's fueling those cognitions Typically, if not always, it's fear of death. It's mm -hmm. the survival or fear of death, survival instinct, fear of death. Um, you know, whether it's about my children and their safety and obsessing about even hand washing or seatbelts, or, which is fine. It's fine to have those natural concerns, but when they become overpowering, and um, I feel that we know that exposure, and, and we know the epidemic of anxiety we have in our populations, mm -hmm. right? And um, we know that exposure to phobias, for instance, is one of the, the most effective ways of, of getting better with that. And it's understanding that I can be in the presence of this and still live. But what I'm hearing from people over and over, and you will see in this book and the stories of transformation that ends this book, is not only can I live, but I can choose to expand. And that will look different for everybody. And that time frame will look different for everybody. So at the beginning, that's not the words I would say to some person. Like, you just hang in there. You're going to expand. You know, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. You know, that would just be. But, the poss but, but I think what somebody, you know, I always would say, Death has torn me apart and it's put me back together differently. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hear also from my storytellers, very much so. So I think that's, that's a lesson, Karen, that I probably didn't even know from everybody I had worked with and from what I'd interfaced with. And it's one of the reasons I highly encourage people if you're seeking sitting with anybody, whether it's a spiritual advisor or a friend or a therapist, I, I would ask them if they've experienced deep loss. I was in the States a couple years ago and sitting across from my friend who was my clinical supervisor and my actual supervisor at one point in time when I ran a partial hospitalization program, psychiatric program, and she had had some major, major, like three major deaths, very, very close to her, uh, impacted her. And at one point we were out to lunch and she leaned over and she whispered to me, 
what in the world were we doing with our clients before we'd experienced this? I wish I could go back to every one of them and tell them I'm sorry. And I was there. I know. I thought I knew grief because of my father. I think we all feel like if we're in that helping role at times, like, but I'm a good listener. I can do that. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like I always tell people when they have to see somebody over parenting issues, please see a parent, <laughs> you know, it's ground. You can't, you know, it's like the, <laughs> it's like the male doctor when a woman's in labor, labor and delivery, telling, patting her on the head and telling her how she's feeling, you know, exactly. you, there's just certain areas you can't fathom the amount of mind, body, cellular effect it has on you until you go through it. Mm -hmm. So that's a, like a multi dot points there of the lessons that I've picked up. But those are like for the acute, you know, I, I have bigger existential lessons, I feel like, that have come through. And um, but I feel like more what who I'm speaking to and that um, it's called death and it's terrible, horrible, no good, very beautiful lessons, mm -hmm. um, field notes from the Death Dialogues Project. And I think. I'm speaking to what I heard over and over and over again was I was looking for stories. I wanted to hear that somebody had gone through this and survived. I wanted to hear how somebody else had done it. Hmm. And um, that's what this is answering. And yeah. hoping to answer is these are coming from stories who've been of people that have been there. And then they wrap around to being able to um, find your community, find these people out there. Cause a lot of you have come on the show, you know, in the podcast and you can listen to this person before you call them and get an appointment with them. If you want to, you know, there's a, a wealth of people out there that have been through the terrible, horrible bits and know what that feels like. Yeah. And so many of those people who've been through it are, have been motivated to do work to help other people at the same time, which is what's really beautiful about it. Because once they know this territory, they see how important it is for those of us who have experienced deep grief to be there for other people who are, are feeling lost in that space. Absolutely. And I think that's part of what I'm referring to with the transformation, but for everybody, obviously it's not that extreme, you know, yeah. if it's just the ability, I, I just think that opening, you know, opening, being, being, let it open you in a way that as you walk forward in life, maybe you, you know, there's a part in the book where I say, you know, you may forevermore look at people differently. The sad person sitting on the park bench, you know, the person that appears to be tearful in the airport. You know, it wasn't until I was flying back for my brother that I was woken up. You know, there's these subcultures out there, right? You know, we're mm -hmm. not just the walking la 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 dancing to our earphones and our ears. You know, there are people all around us that are acutely, acutely grieving and we don't talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. So true. I love what you said. Death has torn me apart and put me back together again differently. Um, that's a, that's a really beautiful image. And I remember, uh, when I was kind of in the throes of terrible grief and guilt after my dad's suicide, I, I remember that every day I would think, I can't wait until this goes away. I can't mm -hmm. wait until I feel like I used to feel. And it was like three years later, I woke up one day and thought, wait a minute, this, this event is so huge. How could it not change everything about me? How could I not end up being totally different after this happened? And as soon as I recognized that, and as you said, I became open to it and was willing to allow it, to allow death to change me and allow death to put me back together again differently, that's when things finally started to flow for me again a little bit. And I started moving gradually and very slowly, but toward that, that process of coming together once, once again. Mm, beautiful. Yes. And, 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 you know, that's a big thing too, is the ands, right? So we can feel horrible grief and there comes a day the, and we'll be able to feel joy, and that might be a while. But another and is listening to one of your um, podcasts where we 
hear from your um, guests who never experienced um, deep, troubling grief with the loss of her partner. And um, that's, that's an aspect as well. So I, I like to think of the word being of grief being, um, yeah, almost redefined. And it doesn't have, it's the, it's the adjustment, right? It's the mm-hmm. remaking after death. And because I think you, from what I remember from that podcast, I think you had a similar experience. I've had a similar experience as well. I had another die, brother die this past October. And it has been much of what your guest described, um, a, not a traumatic experience. And I would have thought in my heart of hearts, and actually it was anticipatory grieving, which may be part of why I was in that space for the previous five years. But um, I, I was not torn apart like I assumed I would have always been when mm-hmm. the, when this brother died. And immediately, almost, no, I had the immediate grief response, right, when I got the phone call, of, co- of course. Um, I, I had that shock response. But almost... Oh, very soon after that, just this expansive sense of relief for him and um, expansion. And um, yeah, and then I got a little sign from him that I asked for, which I'm big on too with this project. I want to hear those stories. I mm-hmm. want to hear when people have felt that they've had connection with their loved one from the other side. And so now I'm I'm pretty bold about that. I just asked for it, <laughs> just mm-hmm. flat out yelled it out and got it. And um, so my grief experience with him that I would have, that would have been traumatic and right in that traumatic chapter has not been. So I think that's the big message too is, um, you know, don't, don't buy into a box of grief looking the same way, you know, and gr- it, grief is as different. Death will have its way with everybody is differently as we are, as humans are, as our fingerprints are. Mm. So true. It's different for each one of us and it's different for every death that we experience too. So it it doesn't repeat itself really. And you can't really say ahead of time, like some of us, you know, people that may have control issues (laughs) might want to do. And for this person, this is how I'm going to handle it. (laughs) Right. If you, you know, that's back to let yourself open. Because if you get into that mindset, then you just clench around anything that doesn't feel like what you planned your grief to look like. And the clenching is where the pain comes. But Mm. also, I have to say, it's hard. I mean, I, the experience post-loss that I've had, the emotional experience, I mean, look at what I've thrown myself into. And, you know, I am the first to raise my hand and said, say yes. You know, part of that was how I processed. I wanted... It opened up the world to me of other grievers, and I wanted to sit with them in a compassionate way and sit with myself in a compassionate way. But it's been a lengthy process, and there's been, yeah, there's been some really tough times, those waves that come through, and my health being affected, you know, grief has has had its way with my body, and um, yeah, it's it's not a, a... yeah, it doesn't always turn out to be something that um, I don't know how to, I don't know really what, how to say what I want to say, you know, it, because you talk about it in a transformative way doesn't mean there's a rainbow every time you look out the window and it's all about light and love. You know, there's some really difficult times through that. Yes. And hence we, people's reactions to clench against that pain. Yeah. The terrible, horrible, no good pain mm-hmm. that also happens to be very beautiful in its own in its own way. And that's what I like to start pointing out for myself and for other people that is coming up with the stories. And much of why that title, riffing off of you know that children's book, yeah, it, um, is the horrible, beautiful, the terrible, beautiful. You know that is, you know, it, it, they sit together. The terrible, beautiful. I mean, this story that this book opens up with this this mother. I mean, if if you want to see the definition in in real life of terrible, beautiful, yeah, that will be it. It's mm. 
there's magic and there's horror in it and things that we places that we don't want to go to and you know a lot of that being wrapped up in magical thinking you know I think culturally historically it's part of the reasons we haven't wanted to sit with people's stories is because um, I've heard it time and time again that historically you know, the superstition that somehow I'm if I think about it too much or if we talk about it you know we're going to invite it in mm-hmm. type of thing mm. and when the the reality of it in so many ways is the opposite. When we think about it and talk about it, we actually invite more life in because we lose some of our fear. We have more energy and more openness to just experience the joy of being here right now, no matter what's going to happen in the future. Absolutely. And I think we could take it back to that, um, you know, those transitional times, death and birth. And I just this year had two daughter-in-laws um, who were going to give birth, were pregnant, and we were doing virtual showers, and one of them was about writing words, and I just wrote the real, <laughs> you know, it's like, and I t- tried to do it kind of poetically, but you know, we don't talk about those conversations surrounding birth as well. It's like, we want to, to sugarcoat the experience as as if you, you know, you don't want to set somebody up for thinking things are going to be bad. Always think positive, whatever. When the reality is then people are unprepared um, for the intensity of the experiences, be it death or be it birth. Mm, So true. So true. We put emphasis on things like buying booties (laughs) for the baby (laughs) and have no idea how, how many times the baby will just kick those booties off. And that's actually not even that helpful. (laughs) Right. (laughs) There are some really challenging, tough parts that we should be spending more time talking about and preparing for. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about you got through the birth. Let's talk about what you're going to feel like for the next <laughs> however many days with your engorged breasts and raw nipples. And, you know, and that's okay. That's the whole point about it, right? Is we need to talk about these things so we know it's okay, that we know that these things happen. Exactly. Exactly. I, it's funny because I remember having the same feeling. I remember when my first child was born and thinking, I can't believe that any other woman has actually gone through this and had a baby because no one's ever told me any of this. And almost the same thing going through my dad's death of thinking, I can't believe anyone else ever felt this way because no one, I never heard anyone talk about it or tell me what this was like. I actually speak to that in my writing. Yes, exactly. I'm looking at every woman and being like, I want to bow at your feet. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like, like, <laughs> These, you know, we are super human, you know, this is how did all of these women do that? And how did they do it multiple times? It just, and then the same with death. Yes. How, you know, we don't talk about this. How do people do this over and over again and, you know, show up for death and sit at the side of death and, oh, it's just so beautiful now, Karen, that we have a Mm -hmm. wave of these these women and men coming up and um, all people, humans coming up to be uh, stepping into that space. They want that work. They're hungry for that work. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. And they're hungry for the conversations, but they're actually showing up at the bedsides. They're, they're there. If you want to place a phone call and say, yeah, I actually am really nervous about my death. Can you walk me through how I can be as prepared as possible um, yeah, it's just amazing. I love that. Yeah, so true. And I mean, Becky, you're one of those people showing up in the work you're doing by making public these conversations and available for everyone to listen to. And I'm sure you, like me, feel grateful too for all the people willing to tell their stories and willing to, to come oh. and have conversations with us and talk about what they've experienced. I absolutely do. I feel, yeah, I I just feel like it's an absolute gift to the world. And what I hear repeatedly 
for themselves, it's, it is transformational. You know, they, you know, I had a, a storyteller here, well, two storytellers who had deaths, really extensive traumatic death experiences over a decade ago that had never told their story ever. And they got up on stage and so poetically and beautifully and deeply told their stories and they were changed forever for it. Wow. So telling our stories changes us. Oh yeah, definitely. And I wanted to ask that that brings up for me because because you referred to the vagina monologues, do you picture the death dialogues going on stage at any time? Well, that was the goal. Mm -hmm. That was the goal. And then this world of podcast, you know, because when I really look at it, um, what, what is it that the goal is? And from a creative aspect, um, which can feel a little, a little bit more ego centered for me, of course, the, the play aspect would be lovely. But when I look at how can I reach more humans. It's like, so every podcast episode is a full house, you know, yeah. <laughs> right. And there's, yeah. so there's how many full houses, um, you know, I've gone to every two weeks, which just seems to be fine. People seem to be fine. I can always do a bonus episode in between if I want, but it, you know, people didn't drop off or anything. And, and to me, when I look at time efficiency and the fact that I do want to live a life, you know, I'm retired from any pra other practice, but this is my work now. And so I'm really um, trying to approach what I put out there in a way that's energy efficient for me. Um, so I, I, I feel compelled to do things more along the death dialogues stage work as in bringing people such as yourself over or having um, authors here maybe and having a night of readings or combining with that my storytellers we were thinking about doing a story slam night and opening it up to the public and asking them to register with me ahead of time you know for five minute story slam which I'd like to do sometime soon but they suggested we do it with my book release um coincide that so I, I would, I think my energy, my bandwidth right now is more with like little hits like that versus writing a bigger piece at this point in time based mm -hmm. on people's stories. Yeah. But who knows? I mean, you yeah. know how it is in the artsy, you know, when you get an inspiration, like if I woke up, if I had a dream and it's like, that's the way to do it, <laughs> then, yeah. then I might just jump on it. You never know. <laughs> well, I can see the power of hearing and seeing something on stage live in person when you're right there feeling the energy of it I can imagine the power of that and yet there's something really important about showing up being there every week or two with a new story and a new conversation that people can listen to over and over again because processing this material about death and grief takes time. And so mm -hmm. it's really good that people have a chance to keep coming back over and over again to the death dialogues and picking out the ones they resonate with. And, and they can even listen to them over and over again if they want to. There's something irreplaceable about that. I mean, that you, you can right. never get that from a stage performance that a one-time evening together on stage. So it's good we have we have different media, I guess, through which to portray this information. It is. And, you know, I have to say it was the pandemic that just shut that down for me. And I just don't feel in a space to open that up. You know, it just, it, the idea, in fact, I was going to be part of the Fringe Festival last year here, um, which was the month of October doing things. Um, yeah, I mean just presenting a production or something. And I got too much anxiety surrounding putting a lot of work into something, a stage production, and then it being canceled and writing on that. And that just told me right then, like just shelve the whole idea of putting forth anything on stage until your heart really sings out that you have to. Yeah. Um, the pa I know the pandemic shook us, shook a lot of us to our bones and the way we were presenting work into the world and, it certainly has me as well. Yeah, definitely. 
Well, oh, Becky, it's so much fun to talk with you. I feel like we're soul sisters in so I many did. ways, and we could I talk endlessly and tell each other stories. <laughs> so oh, I did too. Thank it, you. Yeah, it's been wonderful. I really thank you. And I would love it if we could uh, talk again when your books come out, because I'd love to go into more detail about the books when the time is right for that. So we, we will stay in touch and we'll... We'll talk about that when you're ready to launch them in 2022. But yes, thank me- you. Meanwhile, best of luck with all your future conversations. And I'll be listening and I'm, you'll listen to me. We'll get to hear each other during that time anyway. Absolutely. So I really appreciate you having me on. This has been a beautiful conversation. Oh, yeah, it's, it's my pleasure. And I'm so, I'm so glad we connected and that here we are across the across the across the world really uh, able to support one another's work and that feels feels really wonderful so so thank you for everything you're doing I I would be amiss you know how you're prolific with your podcast you've you're you're the long timer here and thank you so much for the energy you're putting out into the world I'm just I'm old (laughs) that's what it is (laughs) but oh well here's to more of all of this in the future Becky so take care you take care too bye-bye bye-bye I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Becky. I really loved hearing her story in greater detail and depth than I've ever heard it before. And the realization that for all of us, really, all of these threads and pieces and experiences of life that that we've been through in the past are all coming together in certain ways and leading us to where we need to be in order to do the work that we're really meant to do while we're here on this planet. And it can take most of a lifetime to actually figure that out. And I find a great deal of hope in that. I hope you do as well. Even if you haven't seen the full picture yet of how these pieces are coming together, I'll bet you can do something similar. You can trace back the threads through your life of various messages and things you've learned and things that have happened to to you and things you have intentionally done in your life and see how they all come together in some way or another to create this beautiful tapestry of your life. So as I mentioned before, subscribe to the Death Dialogues podcast if you're not already listening to that one. And be sure to share that podcast and also this podcast with other people who might find this kind of content helpful. It's also very helpful to every podcast if you subscribe wherever you happen to listen and then leave ratings and reviews on those sites. You can also help support this podcast by going to my page at patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash E-O-L-U and sign up to make a small monthly contribution. Just a couple of dollars a month uh, gets you onto our team and you can offer something back to help support the podcast and keep it on the air and you'll receive a monthly bonus of some the end of life news update every month uh, as a thank you for joining the team so that's patreon.com slash eolu until next week remember we're here for love that's really what this is all about so face your fear be ready for whatever life brings you next and love each and every moment of this fleeting life bye bye